Welcome to the side event, Global Adaptation Network, Now and Future, co-hosted by the Ministry of Environment Japan and UN Environment Programs. Hi, I am Masataka Watanabe, a Global Adaptation Network Chair. A fundamental prerequisite for climate adaptation is knowledge, be it economic, ecological, or technological. Although this knowledge exists in abundance, actors on the ground do not have sufficient access. The 2015 Paris Agreement includes, for the first time, a global adaptation goal. According to Adaptation Gap Report 2020, the year 2020 has been one of the warmest years on record. Over 50 million people globally have been recorded as directly affected by floods, droughts, or storms, and wildfire have raged with greater intensity in Australia, Brazil, Russia, and the USA, among other countries. There are a growing and pressing needs to mobilize and share adaptation knowledge and lessons. Founded in 2010, Japan and the United States have supported and promoted GAN activities as GAN's core members since its structure. As an umbrella organization spanning most continents, GAN comprises many constituent regional networks, namely APAN, Regatta, EBAFOSA, WANCC, and ECOADAPT. They provide knowledge services in their respective regions. The Global Adaptation Network delivers a worldwide platform to distribute and exchange climate change adaptation knowledge in various ways. Through these networks, GAN connects the global with the local. The GAN Secretary will report on the progress of activities in each GAN regional adaptation network how GAN has supported upscale their network and shared success stories from each regional network. Hi, I'm Liz Mullen Bernhardt, coordinator of the Global Adaptation Network, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to this special GAN session at the 7th APAN Forum. I would like to thank our hosts and co-organizers, the Ministry of Environment Japan, for organizing this event, and also the chair of our long-standing steering committee, Professor Masa Watanabe, for moderating this session. In today's session, we're going to be hearing from a number of our friends, members, and partners about what they see are some of the major successes of GAN over the past decade, as well as some exciting opportunities for GAN in the coming years. Because I think that there's no doubt in any of our minds that building resilience to climate change and sharing knowledge about what is working in adaptation is more important now than ever and that we cannot do this in isolation, but we must work together with all partners at all levels. The event will provide video messages from high-level leaders and youth representatives among GAN's networks and partners, including the United States, which will return to the Paris Agreement this time. We expect that the invited keynote speeches will introduce exciting topics such as the current state of climate change adaptation, new mitigation adaptation efforts, an interface that collects all the adaptation resources information, future trend adaptation resources with the perspectives. We are also looking forward to hearing expectation for the global adaptation network, such as strengthening cooperation with regional networks and contributing to the UNFCCC. It is our honor to invite Mr. Tomohiro Kondo, Vice Minister, Ministry of Environment Japan, High Excellency Gina McCarthy, U.S. National Climate Advisor, the White House, the USA, Ms. Susan Gardner, Director of Ecosystem Division, UNEP, Dr. Yusuf Nasef, Director of Climate Adaptation, UNFCCC, and Ms. Edna Odhiambo, EPIC Network, University of Nairobi. Mr. Tomohiro Kondo, 
Vice Minister for Global Environmental Affairs, Minister of Environment Japan, will give the first message. Would you please welcome Mr. Tomohiro Kondo? Good morning, everyone. My name is Kondo Tomohiro, Vice Minister for Global Environmental Affairs at the Ministry of the Environment in Japan. As you know, the Global Adaptation Network RAM, and the Asia Pacific Adaptation Network APA, are networks promoting knowledge sharing on climate change adaptation, and Japan has been supporting these two important networks since they were first established. We are delighted to be hosting the APA Forum for the first time, and we are very honored to be able to introduce the work of the Global Adaptation Network at this side event today. Let me take this opportunity to extend my gratitude to everyone who has supported and encouraged both Yang and Apple. Especially with Inja Anderson, Executive Director of the NEP, who has served as co-organizer of the APAN Forum and this event, as well as all the staff at UNEP Group and Climate Change Adaptation Unit of UNEP. In addition, I would like to thank all those who show a real understanding of what we want to convey with today's event and who sent us video messages. We very much appreciate these messages from Ms. Gina McCarthy, who is a National Climate Advisor at Winehouse in Washington, Dr. Yusuf Nas, UNFCC's Director of Adaptation, and Ms. Edna Odiambo, University of Nairobi. Climate change is already having an impact across the whole of human society. In recent years, Extreme weather events such as heavy rains, huge hurricanes, and heat waves are occurred in every corner of the world. Early in his premiership, Japan's Premier Prime Minister Yoshihide Suga announced in his policy speech that Japan will become carbon neutral by 2050. If you want to achieve this, we know that the next 10 years up to 2030, uh, absolutely crucial, and we really need to strengthen our policies for transition to decarbonization. Of course, we are already feeling the impacts of climate change, so we must work on adaptation to climate change in a wide range of sectors. What we have in Japan is an individual role specifying adaptation. So we need strengthening cooperation between the relevant ministries and agencies so that adaptation perspectives are embedded in all related policies for areas such as agriculture, forestry, fisheries, disaster risk reduction, and so on. The is also putting focus on improving adaptive capacity on a global scale. A couple of years ago, in 2019, we launched APPLAT, the Asia-Pacific Adaptation Information Platform, providing the necessary scientific knowledge like climate change risk information, as well as helping to develop the human resources required when formulating policies with adaptation in mind. We want to continue to develop APPLAT through practical partnerships with relevant countries and institutes to co-create scientific knowledge and useful tools. And we will be supporting national and local governments in the Asia-Pacific region to promote climate change adaptation. So how can we improve worldwide adaptive capacity? Well, GAN is making headway in this regard by sharing information on the global scale, highlighting the success stories and lessons learned in 
application. There is uniquely position to connect regional networks and makes a significant contribution to information sharing and the dissemination of good practice through these regional networks, particularly on the following three points. The first point is a science-based approach if we want to develop effective adaptation measures to deal with future climate change impacts we must make sure that climate impact assessment is carried out properly. Can 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 share information on efficient climate predict prediction based on scientific knowledge and can play a role in ensuring that people have the necessary skills and expertise to implement and interpret the prediction. The second point is accessibility. Companies and organizations need to have good access to various networks, such as Ebiprat, and we know that can make a significant contribution to transmit this information effectively so it can be applied internationally going forward. The third point is locally led action. Through them, Japan works with the US to provide support for activities by the Epic network. EPIC promotes local action on adaptation, making use of university resources. This innovative idea is a way to involve local resources in local initiatives to actually make a difference. We look forward to further innovation from the EPIC network in the future. Ladies and gentlemen, our world is faced two major crises the COVID-19 pandemic and the climate crisis. And promoting adaptation is essential to overcome both of them. 2021 is an important year for promoting adaptation, as has been shown by the UK during the holding the presidency of COVID-26. We were pleased to see that UK has put priority on strengthening adaptation. Earlier this year, at the Climate Adaptation Summit held by the Netherlands in January, Japan's Environment Minister, Koizumi Shinjiro, called on Alex Salomon, the 26th president, to work together to redesign the post COVID economy and social system and to ensure success of this year's climate conference in Glasgow. We strongly hope that UNEP will invest in invigorate. Land activities and contribute to the success of the 26. Based on the expectations expressed at this event today. It is a very informative message, including the Japanese government's pledge to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050. An individual law specifying adaptation in Japan. The launch of the Asia Pacific Adaptation Information Platform, providing the scientific knowledge and helping to develop the adaptive capacity for policy making. Thank you, Mr. Kondo, for this timely message. The next speaker is Her Excellency Gina McCarthy, U.S. National Climate Advisor, the White House, USA. Would you please welcome Her Excellency Gina McCarthy? Hello, I'm Gina McCarthy, the United States National Climate Advisor. Thanks very much for the invitation to speak today, and it feels so good to be back working with our international partners. In 2015 and 2016, I had the honor of traveling to Japan to meet the Ministry of the Environment and announce new partnerships on mercury, regional air quality, and most importantly, climate change. That work built on a long history of cooperation, both bilaterally and with organizations like the Global Adaptation Network. That work has continued globally since 2016, and today I'm happy to be joining that conversation once again. I can't tell you how much I would like to be joining this group in person today, but that trip will have to wait for a later date. But addressing the climate crisis cannot wait. 
and I'd like to talk to you a bit about President Biden's commitment to tackle the climate crisis while creating good paying jobs and achieving environmental justice. The president also has consistently identified the climate crisis as one of the most existential threats of our time that is gripping our nation and the world. And he's not waiting to take action, getting us started on his first day in office because science is telling us that we don't have a moment to lose to fight against this crisis. President Biden has already committed the U.S. to re-enter the Paris Climate Agreement. And he committed us as well to start undoing the assault on our environment that has occurred over the past four years. That's why, just one week into his administration, President Biden signed an incredibly ambitious executive order that allows the United States to move at both the breadth and the pace that science demands. At its core, the executive office recognizes that climate considerations are an essential element of U.S. foreign policy and national security. That's where my colleague John Kerry, the first ever special envoy for climate, comes in. John has the authority to really drive forward a process that will restore American leadership on climate throughout the world. But here at home, we have to do our part, or we will not be able to make the kind of worldwide change that climate change demands. To that end, the executive order also established the White House Office on Domestic Climate Policy. And as head of that office, I'm responsible for making sure that everyone who works for the president uses every tool available at our disposal to solve the climate crisis. We're truly taking a whole of government approach, not only to tackle the climate crisis within our borders, but to lead by example and ambition. We're going to power our economy with clean energy. We're going to do that in a way that will produce millions of jobs that are going to be good paying, that are going to be jobs that have the opportunities for workers to join a union. Because as President Biden has often told me, when he thinks of climate change, his first thought is about jobs. And it should be, because people need jobs. And our challenge is to use the tools of government to make that happen in the most creative and significant ways that we can find. At the same time, we have to make sure that nobody is left behind. And I'm talking about workers, communities, families, in terms of environmental justice. This really requires us to think beyond emissions and megawatts to tackle one of the most neglected justice and health threats that we now face. President Biden has established a White House interagency task force to specifically address environmental justice, as well as an advisory council to help lead it. He has also directed our Department of Health and Human Services to create an Office of Climate Change and Health Equity. Why? Because after all, climate change is the most significant public health challenge of our time. The President also directed the Department of Justice to establish an Office of Climate Justice because we know that today's communities are hurt by pollution and climate change because existing standards are not enforced to protect those most vulnerable. The Office of Climate Justice will ensure that we enforce existing and new standards and make sure that the affected communities become part of the solution. And these communities don't just deserve justice and protection under the law. They deserve investment and a chance to chart their own futures. In fact, President Biden has committed that 40% of our investment in clean energy will go towards disadvantaged communities. You know, these communities should benefit from the new jobs that are available and have a stake in that better future. President Biden has also established a working group on coal and power plant communities because we have to make sure that in this transition, every agency and government is using every tool at their disposal to drive resources to those very communities that need it most. 
President Biden is delivering on a long-standing commitment to leverage our vast natural resources to contribute to our clean energy future. We're working to make sure the public lands unlock new solar, wind, geothermal, and biomass resources. And in our waters, we have set an aggressive goal to develop offshore wind and the skilled workforce needed to build up that industry. We're also going to focus on the potential and vulnerabilities of our farms and our public lands. Out of the gate, we're working with agencies to see what kind of reductions and mitigation opportunities there are to look at on our public lands to make sure that we can continue to store carbon in our soil as we work with agriculture and to look at how we better manage our forests so we're not seeing the devastating forest fires that we have been having. These lands are already experiencing the effects of climate change but they can also contribute to the solution if we manage them carefully. And finally, as we build, we really do need to build back better, as the president has said. We know where some of the worst impacts of climate change will occur, so we need to work now to protect our coast, strengthen our infrastructure, and build a more resilient electric grid. We can work to avert the worst of climate-related disasters before they happen. And when we recover from the storm events that do come, we have to make sure that we do not repeat the same mistakes over and over. We can build back stronger, smarter, and safer. And as we do, we will create jobs in our most vulnerable communities and areas under transition. But while the actions I have been talking about have mostly been domestic, we know that implications are global. On one hand, we have to deliver on those commitments at home so we can re-engage with the global community and our shared commitments to the climate crisis. On the other hand, this is all about how much more can we do as we rejoin the international conversation. As the past year has shown us through pandemic and economic strife, a global crisis really boils down to a smaller crisis in every country around the globe. If that smaller crisis is not addressed, the consequences ripple out to all the others. But leadership and solutions also ripple outward. Our work at home must be informed by the lessons we learn from our partners, like the Global Adaptation Network. In turn, I hope that creative solutions we put in place in the U.S. will only help spur on accelerated climate action abroad. For climate, we have no time to lose, and we're ready to get to work. Today, I'm honored to be doing that work again as part of this larger community. So thank you again for the opportunity to join you today, and I hope you have a productive session. President Biden's commitment to tackle the climate crisis while creating good paying jobs and achieving environmental justice is a powerful message. We learned that Gina is head of the White House Office on Domestic Climate Policy and responsible for solving the U.S. climate crisis by taking a whole of government approach, powering the economy with clean energy, and producing millions of jobs. Gina, thank you for your positive, future-oriented message. The next speaker is Ms. Susan Gardner, Director of Ecosystem Division, UNEP. Would you please welcome Ms. Susan Gardner? Hello, I'm Susan Gardner, the Director of the Ecosystems Division in UNEP. I'm so glad to be here today to talk about the Global Adaptation Network, which has just continued to grow and strengthen since it was established more than a decade ago. I'd like to express much gratitude to the Ministry of Environment in Japan for bringing us together for this special session, and also for the U.S. Special Envoy for Climate Change and the Director of Ad Adaptation of the UN Climate Change Secretariat for their inspiring words. There's no doubt that climate change is the greatest crisis we face in the world today. 
our Secretary General recently noted in the State of the Planet speech that adaptation must not be the forgotten component of climate action. We have both a moral imperative and a clear economic case for supporting developing countries to adapt and build resilience to current and future climate impacts. So the race to resilience is as important as the race to net zero. Just over two weeks ago, we concluded our fifth UN Environment Assembly and member states took bold steps forward by endorsing our new medium-term strategy for UNEP that is gonna tackle three planetary crises, climate change, nature and biodiversity loss, and pollution, with nature-based solutions running through all three. GAN has an important role to play in how UNEP will work on adaptation as part of this new ambitious midterm strategy. One word that we heard clearly throughout the assembly was urgency. We know that we have very limited time to address climate change. 2020 made this perfectly clear. It was nothing less than a climate disaster for many people throughout the world. Flash floods in Afghanistan, plagues of locusts in East Africa, the wildfires across Australia and the US and the cyclones and the typhoons in India and the Philippines. We can discuss numbers and statistics. And while those do give us facts and data, they really don't convey what it feels like to have your home and nation destroyed. And how does one easily convey the impact of climate change on crop production for people who depend on nature hand to mouth as the sh there's shifts in rains and seasons? So many throughout the world have similar stories and it makes our work on adaptation and resilience even more urgent moving forward. Now is the time to act to unlock nature's full potential for climate action and to ensure that there's a transformation, this full potential for transformation is fully realized in decision-making. UNEP stands ready to assist. Back in 2020, UNEP answered the call uh, to help countries adapt to the impact of climate change and at that time, we knew that we needed some kind of platform to share information and lessons from around the world. And as a result, GAN was started together with a number of regional nodes. Over the last 10 years, and because of the natural evolution of the work on adaptation, the allocation of funding and the number of projects has only grown. And the focus of, of this work has shifted to more and more long-term. As a result today, many nations are planning strategically for medium and long term. And this is truly significant for two reasons. One, it reflects that adaptation and building resilience is not restricted just to developing nations, but all nations. And they're sharing lessons north to south, east to west, and from the globe to the regional level and back. Second, it also allows policymakers to align their national climate action plans with the overall UN Sustainable Development Goals. UNEP is supporting more than 50 countries around the world with implementing ecosystem-based adaptation projects and national adaptation plans that can aim to restore a total of 113,000 hectares of land while benefiting 2.5 million people for example, the City Adapt Project, which is a Jeff-funded project, is helping 115,000 people in San Salvador City to reduce the risk of flooding by 2022. And how do they do it? By restoring urban forests and coffee farms that absorb, absorb the moisture in the ground and thereby reduce flooding. And in Gambia, the UNEP has supported the government to rehabilitate more than 10,000 hectares of degraded forests, savanna, and mangroves, which act as buffer zones, protecting villages from storms and floods. GAN has grown into a role of providing a glue that helps gather all sorts of best practices. And the GAN regional networks 
like the Asia Pacific Adaptation Network, are a strong part of the success. And we need to strengthen these. We also need to grow and establish new networks, like in North America and Europe, which are regions that are increasingly seeing climate impacts of their own. We want to talk about gathering and sharing this vital information more. Talk about what kind of work is, is, is successful on the ground. What do we need to do more of? What do we need to scale up? And how do we overcome barriers? We need to talk about adaptation in urban areas, adaptation in agriculture, and adaptation in different types of ecosystems. Of course, adaptation funding gaps do remain a challenge, but this is changing. And this change was called for by the UN Secretary General at the most recent Climate Adaptation Summit, with a call for 50% of the total share of climate finance provided by all donors and multilateral development banks to be allocated to adaptation and resilience. We saw bold moves from the World Bank, from the African Development Bank, from the French and the Dutch governments as a result. It's been such an incredible year. Over the last 12 months, the global pandemic has really changed the way that we've lived and worked and the way we think about our values. Uh, the pandemic brought into sharp focus the interconnectedness between our health and nature's health and, and the consequence when that relationship is out of balance. And it reminded us of our astounding capacity for resilience when we work together. The world is waking up to adaptation and GAN and the regional nodes are perfectly placed to support this awakening. I'd like to express my gratitude for the long-standing supporters of GAN, including again, the Ministry of Environment of Japan and also the US Environmental Protection Agency. Some almost think of these as the parents of GAN. The GAN movement, which has just grown with momentum, with new ideas involving non-state actors and governments at all level. We're really looking forward to riding this momentum together to follow and support the achievements of GAN and its partners and moving the world from cycles of degradation driven by unsustainable development to making the best use of ecosystem services to support resilient societies and economies. Thank you. It is a very encouraging message. We learn UNEP is now supporting more than 50 ecosystem-based adaptation projects with a focus on nature-based solutions. It is our pleasure to hear that UNEP and IUCN are launching the Global Ecosystem-Based Adaptation Fund this year. UNEP and CTCN are working together on the Adaptation Fund Climate Innovation Accelerator. Susan, thank you for your encouraging message. The next speaker is Dr. Youssef Nasef, Director of Climate Adaptation, UNEP, UNFCCC. Would you please welcome Dr. Youssef Nasef? Thank you very much for inviting me on this uh, esteemed panel. Um, the subject of the GAN, the Global Adaptation Network, has been very close to my heart for a very long time, ever since the inception of this initiative, actually before the inception, since I was involved in the initial design as well. And I'm so glad that uh, having gone through all these years, the GAN has established itself as a foremost initiative for adaptation knowledge, especially in so far as it interfaces with the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Now, uh, if I could reflect on the time that we are living in now, it's becoming a bit cliche to say that we are living in unique times. Yes, we are living through COVID-19, and insofar as this relates to our work, we are really interested in how um, the recovery, the green recovery, will be used and employed to further adaptations. So that's one reality we're looking at. Another one is how the science has given us a stark reminder of the need to transform our systems and has given us only a few years to do so. 
And this has been exhibited both by the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, in its warming of 1.5 degree report, as well as IPBIS, the Intergovernmental Platform for Ecosystem Services, in their global assessment. And, and so we know that we need to transform. We know that adaptation will be needed in this transformation, and we know that it will need knowledge. Now, the third aspect that I would like to bring up is the positive political signals we are seeing on adaptation ambition these days. There is a renewed momentum, there is renewed leadership, and a desire for more and more action to be taken and to be taken seriously. And finally, uh, this year and since last year, we have seen an enhanced attention to nature-based solutions and ecosystem-based adaptation. Now, what do all these have in common? It is the centrality of science and of knowledge. And not just that, but in our process, in the UNFCCC process, we have different adaptation work streams that are going ahead and progressing rapidly, all of which center, again, on science and knowledge. Whether it is the preparation of national adaptation plans, which enable countries to prioritize and implement medium and long-term actions for adaptation, or our work on loss and damage, where methodologies are being built and, and the, the, the knowledge is being synthesized to enable countries also to be able to address um, aspects of loss and damage that, uh, that, that uh, will, will impact on them, or our work on adaptation knowledge through the Nairobi Work Programme, which is our knowledge hub and our stakeholder engagement initiative, and under which we have a collaboration with the GAN, the Global Adaptation Network, on filling knowledge gaps at sub-regional level. Now, over the years, the GAN has established itself in a very unique niche, which is uh, that of being an inter-regional network. We know that the GAN operates in different regions, distinctly, but collaboratively. And it interfaces with us, with the UNFCC in all its work. In fact, one of the, of the major benefits of having the GAN uh, in our system is that it's a very nice interface, a buffer that links the international level, uh, not just with the regional, but with the sub-regional and national and sub-national. And this has been really effective in furthering the, the cause of adaptation and adaptation knowledge. And as I look forward, and the context gives us the opportunity to scale up action and to enter into a new phase, um, I see the centrality of the GAN as even gaining more importance as we become more science-based and more knowledge-based. Having said that, again, as we look forward, I think key to enhancing and scaling up the effectiveness of the GAN will lie in its support for um, research institutions, for universities, um, for knowledge producers. And so um, in the future, I'm hoping that we will collaborate um, with the Global Adaptation Network in pursuing more actions that target the youth, that target universities, and, and that enable um, these academic institutions to interface with the surrounding environment, both the private sector and the public sector, and the municipal level, municipal institutions and cities. In fact, um, cities are emerging as a major hub of resilience innovation, and it's really important to capture that synergy. And then again, to bring it back to the political process, the international policymaking environment. And so as we help the GAN navigate that paradigm shift that's happening due to all these drivers of change that I mentioned at the outset, I'm hopeful that then we can collaborate in creating this new reality of further interfacing the GAN with different themes, with different actors, especially with the youth, with academic institutions, and the UNFCCC is here to help and, and to create further synergies and further collaborations with the Global Adaptation Network. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Your expectation of GAN's activities shown clearly in the message. You suggested that GAN's effectiveness rests on the centrality of adaptation knowledge producers. Collaboration across universities and research institutions is key to elevating adaptation action and links with the private and public sectors 
especially with cities, would maximize synergies. Yusef, thank you for your very supportive message. The next speaker is Ms. Eduna Odhiambo, Epic Africa Network. Would you please welcome Ms. Eduna Odhiambo? My name is Edna Odhiambo. The EPIC Network is the educational partnerships for innovation in communities. And basically what EPIC seeks to do is to secure a tripartite partnership between universities, local governments, and communities. So the EPIC model uses the classroom, existing courses as an opportunity to give students real-time learning experiences by driving projects that have been selected by the community and the local government as important to secure sustainability. Since EPIC focuses on higher learning institutions and linking it, of course, to you know, local governments to drive um, sustainable projects in communities, we are very lucky to be dealing with young minds who on average are between age 20 to 25 for undergraduate courses and perhaps age 25 to 40 for many of the graduate courses. What we've seen is freshness, the innovativeness that young minds bring to the table. We also see their optimism, which is quite refreshing, their ability to disarm environments and push the envelope, even where government bureaucracies may be heavy, is extremely commendable. EPIC is also giving them an opportunity to pay it forward and invest in their communities. We have presence in East and Southern Africa and an upcoming hub in West Africa. Soon, we will be having strong nodes spanning across the continent, enabling students to get real-time learning opportunities, driving changing communities, and transforming local government approaches towards driving sustainable, scalable projects. So definitely the potential of EPIC to achieve communities that are being transformed by young minds in partnership with the local government is tremendous. So we are happy to work with GAN because they believe in partnerships to be able to achieve climate adaptive capacities and also the opportunity to be able to utilize young minds to drive scalable projects across communities. EPIC is a unique activity to establish the educational partnership between the university, local government, and community. GAN supported the EPIC network as one of GAN's core activities, and we are happy to hear the real actions in the project in Africa. Edna, thank you for the lessons from EPIC Africa network. The next speaker is Ms. Liz Barnhart, GAN coordinator, UNEP, and she will introduce the GAN's activity. Would you please welcome Ms. Liz Barnhart? Hi, it's me again. In this first phase of GAN, we have enjoyed a number of successes. Two of the most exciting for me are LACI, the Lima Adaptation Knowledge Initiative, which we carry out on behalf of UNEP together with the UN Climate Change Convention. LACI works to identify and close adaptation knowledge gaps all over the world by convening stakeholders and experts at the sub-regional level. I'm very excited that we just carried out an excellent workshop for LACI in the Pacific Islands in order to bring those inputs to the APAN Forum to you this week. And we are taking LACI forward in a phase two of work in other regions around the world, such as the Middle East and North Africa. You'll hear about both of those in this segment today. A second initiative that I'm very excited about is called EPIC, the Educational Partnerships for Innovation in Communities. EPIC has been working since 2010 to help increase the resilience of cities all over the world by pairing them with their local universities to add resources to solve sustainability challenges. EPIC is now expanding to the Asia Pacific region. We are going to have a workshop and training later this year, and I'm very excited to see that come to fruition. A major new opportunity for all of us is the new Decade on Ecosystem Restoration that is starting later this year in June 2021 and will run until 2030. We hope to strengthen the adaptation pillar within this work. 
Among other ways, GAN will be supporting this work by working through and with a new 20 million euro fund for ecosystem-based adaptation, which is supported by ICI and implemented by UNEP and IUCN. We're opening our first call for proposals later this month and the fund will be operational for the next five years. Now I will hand over to our members and partners. Over to you. Dear all, adaptation to adverse impacts of climate change and climate-induced extreme events, as well as exploiting any beneficial opportunities is knowledge intensive. In Asia and the Pacific region, the climate crisis is threatening people's well-being, food security, and worsening poverty. Situation in the region differs widely. Therefore, adaptation knowledge gap varied widely too, and gap is very high. Asia Pacific Adaptation Network in collaboration with Global Adaptation Network is supporting Lima Adaptation Knowledge Initiative of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. Two weeks ago, we have conducted lucky workshop for the Pacific Island countries, and you will be hearing more during APAN Forum. Dear participants, partners, Resilience for all cannot be built without addressing adaptation needs in Asia and the Pacific, which is home of about 60% of the world population and the biggest contributor to global GDP, which is about 35%. Thank you very much. I run the Climate Adaptation Knowledge Exchange Program, or CAKE, our online community of practice for adaptation practitioners across North America. I think GAN plays a critical role in connecting people, decision makers, practitioners, systems at all scales of power, um, be it nonprofits, governments, private sector, to each other and to the best available information. And this network is what's absolutely crucial in the fight against climate change. I enjoy working on the GAN uh, because it's at the intersection of climate policy, action, engagement and, and science. Uh, it is uh, a chance to see firsthand some amazing work on the ground that is being, uh, that being undertaken in the region and elsewhere. Uh, and I get the privilege of working with some very dedicated people and institutions on climate change adaptation. Uh, the GAN is a uh, important uh, platform, uh, especially in regions that are highly uh, vulnerable to the impacts of climate change, such as West Asia. Uh, future, uh, what would I like to achieve with the GAN? Uh, I'd like to continue supporting uh, the GAN being uh, at the forefront of knowledge on adaptation in the region and working on initiatives to bridge knowledge gaps, such as the LACI uh, Adaptation Knowledge Initiatives, uh, and to support our member countries here in West Asia uh, increase their knowledge uh, on climate change adaptation and increase their resilience uh, for their societies and their economies going forward in the future. I hope uh, everyone has a wonderful forum uh, and until next time, bye. And what we are hoping to achieve uh, with Ghana in future is firstly, when you take the context of adaptation within the African continent today, the core of adaptation motivation in Africa is also economic. Hence, collaborating with GAN in generating knowledge that informs on policy and operational investments that unlock tangible socioeconomic opportunities from climate adaptation becomes imperative. And it is very, very important to make the connection in regions, especially with GAN, because there is this African proverb that says, the one who learns teaches. And we know that adaptation is a process with no definitive endpoint. New challenges will continue to arise, and with them, continuous innovation in the adaptation space will continue to, to, to come as regions innovate uh, different aspects and array of knowledge will continue to be generated. And with these, the cross hybridization of this knowledge means regions have something new and fresh to learn from each other. So connections between regions are critical to ensure a continuous learning loop of what works for a phenomenon that has no definitive endpoint. And GAN becomes instrumental in playing in this space. Thank you. Our regional network, Regata, the regional getaway for technology transfer and climate action, has actually been a great platform for the mobilization and contribution to the dialogue on climate change in the region. In the last few years, uh, we have been able to start 
uh, several communities of practice, uh, develop technical publications, organize uh, exchange events among countries in the region, develop online trainings, and of course, mobilizing funds for climate action. We do see the great value of the Global Adaptation Network in terms of strengthening South-South uh, cooperation and global action against climate change. Uh, so wishing you all the best for this meeting and for the APAN forum taking place this week and hoping to see you all soon, maybe in Panama. Good luck. For the Global Adaptation Network, we have big hopes that you and other networks will join us in building a global nature conservation restoration movement under the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration, which will be publicly launched on the 5th of June. And under the hashtag Generation Restoration, we will bring adaptation as a centerpiece into all the activities that have to do with ecosystem-based adaptation with nature conservation and restoration so that by 2030 we will have not only reset humankind's relationship with nature but also ensured that nature plays its full role in mitigating the climate crisis and that we can stop biodiversity loss so we wish you all the best uh, for this conference and um, join generation restoration this is the logo of the un decade all the best to the GAN network. We co-produce knowledge with strategic partners to scale up adaptation action at thematic and sub-regional levels. Sure, Fatima, absolutely. The UNEP and GAN have been critical partners of the UNFCCC. I would particularly like to highlight our collaboration in the context of the Lima Adaptation Knowledge Initiative, LACI in short. For the past several years, we have been working together in sub-regions to help countries and partners prioritize and close adaptation knowledge gaps. So far, we have worked together in seven sub-regions. LACI has catalyzed multiple collaborations to close knowledge gaps. Our partners, for example, have been regional nodes of GAN, for example, including APAN for Hindu Kush Himalayas and Pacific SIDS, UNEP West Asia for MENA. The initiative that Rogina describes will continue over 2021. Our overall goal for the LACI is to close all priority knowledge gaps that have been identified in the subregions. As part of scaling up the LACI, by the end of 2021, we, have, we will have convened experts in two new subregions. This includes the Pacific Island Small Island Developing States and one from the African subregion. We, in partnership with GAN, will also to continue to fill knowledge gaps in North Africa and the West Asia, including other subregions. We should have case studies to share in the next few months. ECAT is a climate change and environmental research organization established in the year 2009 with a vision of promoting climate change knowledge in local level to support local people to enhance their capacity in the Global South. The Global Adaptation Network of UNEP also holds similar objective in contributing and promoting comprehensive approaches to climate change adaptation measures globally. Bangladesh being a developing country from the Southeastern Asia is considered to be one of the most climate vulnerable countries in the world. Here, adaptation measures to climate change are emphasized. Therefore, knowledge exchange in terms of climate change adaptation are key issues. Being a junior research officer, I firmly believe APAN and GANG can be great platforms where adaptation knowledge and ideas can be exchanged and strong networks can be built to ad address the global climate crisis that we are all facing. Greetings, everyone. I worked with the GAN to assemble an international and partnership that included the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, the U.S. National Science Foundation, ICLE, the International City County Management Association, and the EPIC Network Secretariat to introduce and foster the adoption of the EPIC model as a powerful, time-tested, and highly effective tool for enhancing local government and community capacity in cities in the Global South to adapt, become more sustainable, and build resilience. In other words, take advantage of capacity already on hand or in the in the vicinity. So 
It's my hope that looking down the road that the relevant, that the revised GAN strategy will result in a long-term commitment on the part of the GAN and other international partners to expand the EPIC Africa Regional Network and the anticipated new EPIC Asia Regional Network throughout Africa and throughout the Asia, Asia Pacific region by way of establishing a number of connected but autonomous regional networks within Africa and the Asia Pacific region. Thank you again. Take care. The EPIC Network is an international nonprofit organization that unites the creativity, expertise, and vast human capital of universities with local governments and communities to address resilience and climate adaptation in alignment with the UN's Sustainable Development Goals. We achieve this through helping universities and local governments partner through our award-winning EPIC model, which is a unique partnership model that allows for adaptation and innovation efforts to occur on a massive scale while bringing value to all involved. To date, the EPIC network has completed over 1,700 projects in over 300 cities across the globe. We love working with GAN because they're able to help us reach audiences broadly and deeply in ways that we wouldn't be able to do alone. Some of our most impactful work done with GAN to date has come from our EPIC training workshops in Sub-Saharan Africa. These events helped launch numerous EPIC programs across the region and included train the trainer activities that allow local leaders to launch the regional EPIC Africa network. At the moment, I'm doing a survey line transects on coastal milkwoods, Mumusops Capra, to help a master's student collect data to investigate the effects of sea level rise on uh, uh, our coastal dune system. As you might know, Durban uh, has a, a really well-established uh, open space system that, that includes our coastal areas and uh, it forms the basis of our community-based, ecosystem-based adaptation. And more recently, the GAN has supported us with our educational partnerships for innovation and communities, EPIC research networks, building uh, our African network uh, so as you can see, uh, climate change research is particularly supporting uh, our ca capacity building efforts in Africa. Very, very important in our research. The message is from speakers regarding the efforts on mitigation and adaptations and suggestions for the role of GAN's activities would be precious in response to this changing world. The highlight of key messages is summarized as follows. In 2020, the Japanese government pledged to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050 through strengthening policies for a transition to decarbonization. Japan also has an individual law specifying adaptation embedding adaptation perspectives into all related policies. To improve adaptive capacity on a global scale, Japan launched APPLAT, the Asia-Pacific Adaptation Information Platform, providing the necessary scientific knowledge and developing the region's adaptive capacity for policy making. President Biden has already committed to tackling the climate crisis by taking a whole-of-government approach, powering the economy with clean energy, creating good-paying jobs, and achieving environmental justice. We know where some of the worst impact of climate change will occur so that we can build back stronger, smarter, and safer. How we work at home must be informed by the lessons we learn from our partners like the Global Adaptation Network. In turn, I hope the creative solutions we put in place in the US will only help spur accelerated climate action abroad. UNEP wants to meet the new medium-term strategy with GAN in focusing on ecosystem-based adaptation and nature-based solutions. UNEP supports more than 50 ecosystem-based adaptation projects and helps governments worldwide access to finance for adaptation. 
such as the Global Ecosystem-Based Adaptation Fund and Adaptation Fund Private Innovation Accelerator. UNEP is thankful to the Minister of Environment Japan and the US EPA, who is considered GAN's parent. The Global Adaptation Network remains as relevant as ever in the context of this changing world. The GAN has served as an essential catalyst to mobilize adaptation knowledge to support planning, policy making, and implementation of climate resilient development. The GAN is a massive interregional effort at nurturing and sharing adaptation knowledge and GAN's effectiveness rests on the centrality of adaptation knowledge producers. Youth, students, and universities are agents of changing in adaptation. Collaboration across the universities and research institutions is key to elevating adaptation action and links with the private and public sectors, essentially with cities, would maximize synergy. The EPIC model uses existing class courses to give students real-time learning experiences by driving the project selected by the community and local government. It enables the students to learn to drive changing communities and transform local government approaching to the sustainable capable project. The momentum for decarbonization is accelerating and at the same time, actual adaptation action has been implemented and invested in each country. Massive information and knowledge will be running through GAN and accumulated within the GAN. GAN's role is to mobilize adaptation knowledge in support of planning, policy making, and implementation of climate resilient development at the global level. Therefore, it is a big challenge to catalyze the adaptation knowledge accumulated in each region developed under different climate, culture, social, and technological backgrounds. GAN Forum could be a good opportunity to discuss how to find the solution. Let's work hard together. Finally, we'd like to express our sincere gratitude to the Ministry of Environment Japan and UNEP GAN for co-hosting the GAN event and the 7th APAN Forum Secretariat for providing this critical opportunity to organize the GAN event. We'd like to express our sincere appreciation to all invited speakers who spend their busy time preparing for the video messages. Thank you for joining us. Good day and good night.